in a book called A Day in Old Athens, published in the year 1910, a historian named William Stearns, da Stearns Davis writes these words. To three ancient nations, the men of the 20th century owe an incalculable debt. To the Jews, we owe most of our notions of religion. To the Romans, we owe traditions and examples in law, administration, and the general management of human affairs, which still keep their influence and value. And finally, to the Greeks. We owe nearly all of our ideas as to the fundamentals of art, literature, and philosophy, in fact, of almost the whole of our intellectual life." End quote. The city of Athens, in particular, represented the great cultural and intellectual history of Greece, a culture that Alexander the Great had spread throughout the ancient world. And the ideas that came out of Athens shaped Western civilization. Yeah. One commentator said this about Athens, in its agora, Socrates had taught. Here was the Academy of Plato, the Lyceum of Aristotle, the porch of Zeno, and the garden of Epicurus. Here men still talked about philosophy, poetry, religion, anything and everything. It was the art center of the world. The Parthenon, the most beautiful of temples, crowned the Acropolis. Perhaps more than any other ancient city, Athens represents the city of man. That's why the church father Tertullian asked this question, what has Jerusalem to do with Athens? Amen. Athens represents man's wisdom and culture apart from God and the intellectual pursuit of truth apart from God's revelation. Yes. And so when Paul stands up to preach there in Athens, his preaching is going to show the conflict between human wisdom and revealed truth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. If you follow the storyline of Acts, you see that Paul apparently did not even mean to go to Athens. He was there waiting for his companions after persecution from the Jews had forced him out of Thessalonica and then out of Berea. Yeah. And even in this, we learn a little bit of a lesson from the Apostle Paul. If we want to serve God, we have to rely on the sovereignty of God and be ready to preach wherever we find ourselves with opportunity. And Paul is going to have an opportunity here in the city of Athens. Earlier in the book of Acts, in Acts 14, 16... Paul had made the statement that in the past, God let the nations go their own way. In Romans 3.25, he says that God overlooked their sin. But God never completely deserted the nations. They had both conscience and natural revelation, but the nations had mostly ignored these messages. Yes. That's exactly what Paul's point is in Romans chapter 1, where he says that although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God. Now, God did not send judgment on the nations, but He did not send preachers either, until Paul the Apostle came as the Apostle to the Gentiles. And so we see a little bit of God's sovereign plan for world history unfolding here. The times of ignorance that Paul references in his sermon in Athens corresponds to what Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 3 verses 4 to 6 where he mentions the mystery of Christ being revealed to him. This mystery that God had kept hidden but then revealed to the Apostle Paul was the mystery of Gentile inclusion in the purpose of God. And this inclusion was going to come through the gospel the preaching of the gospel, the preaching of the resurrection of Christ. So what's the meaning of the days in which we live? This is a time for preaching. This is a time for repentance for the nations. A time of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. You see, cities like Athens represent people, societies, cultures, which are all subject to sin and corruption and judgment. But God has care for the city of man, as also seen in the book of Jonah. And it would be an interesting study to compare the book of Jonah with the book of Acts. Our culture is looking a lot like Athens. 
You might even say we are living in the ruins of Athens. We're pagan once more, you see. And the institutional church is failing to reach this culture. All the numbers are showing it. What I want to say to you today is that we should avoid either running from paganism or compromising with it. What we need that is lacking today is a message for our pagan culture. America looks a lot like Athens, so how should we respond? And I think in Paul, the apostle, we see an example of how a believer in Christ responds to a pagan culture. We can learn how to respond to our own pagan culture by noticing what Paul saw in Athens, yeah. how he felt, where he went, and what he said. Yes, amen. How, what he saw, how he felt, where he went, and what he said. I wanna, want us to consider this under these four headings of see, feel, go, and declare. In our modern Athens, there's something for us to see, there's something for us to feel, there's some places for us to go, and there's something for us to declare. So first of all, there's something for us to see. What should we see? We should see the idols underneath all of the sins of our society. The New King James translation says that when Paul got to Athens, he saw the city was given over to idols. Young's literal translation says that Paul was beholding the city wholly given to idolatry. <clears throat> the New Jerusalem Bible captures this as well, that Paul saw in Athens the sight of a city given over to idolatry. Can you just imagine a whole city devoted to idolatry? That's literally what Paul saw in the city of Athens. The ancient writer Xenophon calls the city of Athens, quote, all altar, all sacrifice and offering to the gods. Another writer says that Athens had more images than all the rest of Greece put together. Pliny, the historian, states that in the time of Nero, Athens had over 30,000 public statues or gods, besides countless private ones in the homes. Another writer said, kind of humorously, it was easier to find a god than a man in the city of Athens. Given over to idolatry. There's a story about a plague that hit ancient Athens. And to stop this plague, the Athenians went out to the hillsides and they sacrificed to every god that they knew. And when they had finished doing that, they even made an altar to the unknown god which is what Paul saw when he came to Athens. In spite of the great intellectual history of Athens, God never even mentions the great thinkers in Scripture. Their idolatry was unacceptable to him, and their wisdom was foolishness. 1 Corinthians 1, 18-25. Their minds and their hearts were darkened. Ephesians 4, 17-19. And the result of this was moral degeneration. That is why, as one writer says, we cannot separate the wisdom of Athens from the idols of Athens. One naturally led to the other. Matthew Henry said about this passage in Acts, It is observable that there, where in Athens, where human learning most flourished, idolatry most abounded. And the most absurd and ridiculous idolatry, which confirms that of the apostle, that when they professed themselves to be wise, they became fools, and in the business of religion were of all other the most vain in their imaginations. The world by wisdom knew not God. They might have reasoned against polytheism and idolatry, but it seems the greatest pretenders to reason were the greatest slaves to idols." End quote. Now, Greece is famous for its pantheon of deities. Actually, all ancient cultures were polytheistic. They worshipped many gods. Actually, what they did is they worshipped deified personifications of their lusts or aspects of nature that they either feared or relied upon. That's idol ancient idolatry. For example, the, god, the Greeks worshipped Ares, the god of strength. They worshipped Aphrodite, the goddess of beauty. 
They worshipped Dionysus, the goddess, the god of drunkenness. They worshipped Hermes, the god of athletics. They worshipped Apollo, the god of music. That kind of gives me pause because do Americans worship any of those gods today? Oh yes, very much so. The gods are still with us today. All human cultures tend to become idolatrous. At the root of all sin is idolatry. Idolatry is not just a sin. Idolatry is sin. The breaking of the first and primary commandments that's why Calvin said man's mind is an idol factory. Yeah, that's right. Idolatry is, is man making his own God, worshiping creation rather than the creator, and replacing God with other things. Now today in America you probably won't see someone with a graven image, so how do you know that we worship idols today? Well, it's whatever gives people meaning and worth. Yeah. It's whatever they attach their affections to. Yeah. Whatever gives them comfort and security. Those are idols. Amen. Idolatry is the sin, you see, beneath the sins yeah. Yeah. of our society. Yeah. Yeah. Cultural idols today include money, family, romance, beauty, youthfulness, strength, pleasure, fame, power, position, career, education, patriotism, religion, philosophy, relationships, institutions, and possessions. That's why one writer said, culture is religion externalized. Americans are very religious, just like Athens. Now, many of those things I mentioned that are idols in our culture are not evil in and of themselves. Is there anything inherently evil about the love of family, for example? No. Many of these things are in and of themselves good things. They become evil apart from God when they are made the ultimate things in life. There's also a moral issue beneath all idolatry and man's rejection of God. There's a moral issue. Mankind wants to be free from all restraint and all accountability. You see, God has revealed who He is through His Word, and we must accept that revelation. That's why it says in Deuteronomy 4 verse 12 that Israel saw no form that they could copy in an idol, but heard the voice of the Lord. God reveals Himself through His Word. You can't make a form out of God. By making his own gods, man misrepresents and distorts the glory of the true God. When men worship false gods, they're not worshiping God. They're actually worshiping demons, according to 1 Corinthians 10.20. That's why it's crucial that men turn from idols to serve the living and true God. 1 Thessalonians 1, 9, and 10. And as Paul is going to say at the conclusion of his message, God has promised to judge all idolatry. So there's something to see. Secondly, there's something for us to feel in our modern Athens. Feel a godly jealousy for those in error. Feel a godly jealousy for those in error. The word that Luke uses to describe Paul's emotional response in Athens is a very hard word to translate into English. It could literally mean that Paul had a seizure when he saw the idols, or that he had a fit. It does not simply mean that he got angry. It's more complex than that. The various translations say things like this. He was deeply distressed. His spirit was provoked within him. His spirit was troubled. His spirit was stirred in him. He grew exasperated. He was deeply troubled. His whole, I like this one, his whole soul was revolted. But none of them say Paul got mad. Doesn't say that he simply got angry. This experience, this emotional response that Paul had to the idolatry in Athens is not without scriptural precedent. This is similar to what is said of Phinehas, Mm -hmm. that he was zealous for the Lord. Of Elijah, who was very jealous for the Lord. Of David, who was grieved that the heathen did not obey the law of God. 
of righteous Lot, whose soul was vexed by the people of Sodom. It is said of the righteous in Ezekiel that they sigh and cry for all the abominations which are done in the midst of the land. And when our Lord came for the final time to Jerusalem, he looked at the city, and he beheld the city and wept over it. Yes. Amen. <clears throat> I believe that Paul was feeling the Lord's jealousy, which is what God feels when he sees people worshiping idols. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Now many Americans react very negatively to the idea of God being jealous. It's viewed as a negative reaction. But think about it this way. Jealousy can actually be an expression of love. Now think about this for a moment. Love is not just sweet and tender. Love also is full of thunderous, passionate emotions. You see, God has a right to feel jealous for us because He made us. And we're His. He made us for Himself. And he doesn't take it lying down when we give ourselves to idols. Amen. When he sees people worshiping idols, God feels jealous, which involves both indignation and compassion. You see, the opposite of love is not indifference. Excuse me, the opposite of love is indifference, not indignation. The opposite of love is indifference, not indignation. This is hard for Americans to understand, see, but it's true. In fact, this jealousy, which is a combination of both indignation and compassion, I believe is one of the keys in Scripture to understanding the nature of God. It's also the key to understanding what it means to serve God. You see, Jesus, when he came into the world in the flesh, Jesus was both truth and tears, not just one or the other. The problem is, is that in our flesh, you generally can't do both. You will probably have one extreme reaction or the other. If you respond in your flesh, according to whatever your personality is, there are some people whose personality thunders forth in anger. There are some people's personality who is very tender and sweet. But if we can't have both truth and tears... We won't be effective in ministry. We won't be much like God, and we won't be like the Apostle Paul. The gospel changes how we feel about and relate to the world around us. You see, the gospel is intensely personal, but it isn't private. What people want today is an inward peace for themselves, which is more like psychology than gospel. But God wants us to learn to hate the things that he hates and to love the things that he loves. Amen. He wants our passions and our desires to be conformed to those of Jesus. So ask yourself, do I look with sorrow and compassion on the lost who as the Athenians are worshiping worthless idols? Does it grieve me? Do I have this godly jealousy? You see, until we're transformed by the gospel, there's no amount of guilt or institutional enthusiasm that can propel us into real ministry for Christ. That's right. There's a lot of people being propelled into ministry by guilt. Yeah. You've got to fulfill the Great Commission. Yeah. There's a lot of people being propelled into ministry to support the institution. But until your heart is really changed by the gospel, you won't be able to minister effectively because you will tend towards one extreme or the other. You either just get angry at sinners or you'll, or you'll feel a, a kind of compassion where you maybe won't say what needs to be said. Many people today are, are perhaps so compassionate they aren't even willing to say what needs to be said. That's right. Amen. <clears throat> The question is, how can we become this kind of person that Paul is here in Athens? How can we get this godly jealousy? We have to make a beeline, as Spurgeon would say, for the cross. That is where, at the cross, we see the righteous indignation of God against sin and merciful compassion for sinners. Those things meet in the cross. What we need to do is understand the gospel better. Those who have only indignation against sin or only compassion for sinners don't understand the gospel. 
We won't be able to speak like Paul until we feel like Paul, and we can't feel like Paul until we understand the gospel like Paul. Amen. So Paul was certainly not impressed with Athens, as many people today would be. Paul was not appreciative of culture if that culture despised God. So there's something for us to see. Secondly, there's something for us to feel. Thirdly, there's a place for us to go. Go into the marketplace with your faith. Now Paul, when his spirit was stirred up, he knew he could not procrastinate. He knew that God's spirit was stirring up his spirit. And one of the fastest ways to quench the Holy Spirit is to procrastinate. When he stirs you to action and you repeatedly delay to respond, he, you will eventually quench his fire in your heart. So Paul's spirit was stirred and he immediately did something. He went into the marketplace. One thing you will notice about Paul is that he never worried about success or failure, either one. That was in God's sovereign hands. His job was to act and to do something. And that's our job too. Every one of us can do something to oppose idolatry and advance God's kingdom on earth. And if God is moving you to do something, do it. Don't, don't procrastinate. And don't be afraid to stand alone if you have to. Paul had to stand alone there in the city of Athens. He didn't run away from paganism. Where would we be today if Paul had been too afraid to go to the Gentiles with the gospel? Where would we be today if Luther had been too afraid to stand up against the Catholic Church? Where would we be today if Tyndale had, not, had been too afraid of the King of England to translate the Bible into English? See, don't be afraid. Don't be overwhelmed by evil and idolatry and unbelief. Over, the Bible says overcome evil with good. Amen. It's appropriate to be troubled. It is not appropriate to be overwhelmed and to just give up. We can be faithful in our modern Athens. Paul did not compromise. He did not succumb to the paganism around him and admit defeat. He did not give up on his witness. And we can also be faithful in the midst of a wicked and perverse generation, as Jesus called his generation. Now, Paul, what, where did he go? What did he do? He, he went to the synagogue. That was his custom. The gospels for the Jew first. At least in the synagogue, there were some people who knew the true God. But Paul in Athens also went into the marketplace. The Greek marketplace, or the agora, was the place where all the business of that society was conducted. There's really no modern thing like it, except maybe the virtual marketplace on the internet. The agora was the place you shopped for everything in Athens. And so what Paul is really doing when he goes into the, into the marketplace in Athens, he's saying, shoppers, listen to me. Here is the way. You're all looking for something. Right? Yeah. You're all looking for something. I have the way. I know the way. And Paul spoke so effectively in the marketplace, he was actually invited to speak in another place in Athens, the Areopagus, or Mars Hill is the Roman uh, translation. Another public forum was the Areopagus, where legal cases were decided, the city fathers met to discuss the, the political issues of the local gov uh, government, and ideas were discussed and debated by the philosophers. And there's really no perfect modern equivalent to the Areopagus either, except for maybe the university. So Paul went into the marketplace. He went into the Areopagus with his faith. And what he did here... What Paul did by taking his faith into the public square, if you will, in Athens, was in direct opposition to two basic principles of paganism that are still with us today in America. What Paul did was in opposition to these two things that many Americans believe. One is that everyone has their own truth and no one can claim to have the truth, which, by the way, is the logical outcome of polytheism. You see, in the ancient world, everybody had their own God, so the... The fishermen had their God. The carpenters had their God. The city of Athens had its God. The city of Babylon had their gods. But nobody, nobody who's a carpenter would, would ever dare to say to a fisherman that you should worship my God. Nobody from the city of Babylon would dare to say to the Athenians, you should worship our gods. 
that's polytheism. That's the basis for this modern relativism. Yeah, that's right. That everybody has their own truth, but nobody has the truth. Yeah. Uh-huh. But see, if there's one God, mm-hmm. then there's one truth. Amen. A- another logical outcome of this is that religion is a private matter. Since there's no absolute, religion is just a private matter of personal choice, never to be brought out and debated in the public sphere. Most Americans believe it's all right to have a private faith as long as you don't bring it into your public life and try to get other people to accept it. And so we see, you see how our culture is pagan once more. And what Paul does is in total opposition to that. He just goes right into the public sphere and starts talking about Jesus. So is, what does the Bible say about this? Is, is truth just a personal, private matter never to be discussed openly? What does the Bible say? The Bible says this, Wisdom cries aloud in the street. In the markets, she raises her voice. Proverbs 1.20 that's why Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for salvation. If the modern church is not taking the gospel into the marketplace of today, it's either because it has succumbed to pressure from the pagan culture and is therefore ashamed of the gospel, or it does not believe the gospel will be effective or powerful in the marketplace. But Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation. Now, if you are going to go public with your faith and take the gospel into the marketplace of our pagan culture, you will, of course, meet pagans there. Mm -hmm. Right? Paul did. He also had a debate with some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. When he told them about Jesus and his resurrection, they said, This babbler has picked up some strange ideas. Others said, He's pushing some foreign religion. This is verse 18 of chapter 17. Another translation says, Even a few Epicurean and Stoic philosophers argued with him. Some said, I like this translation, what can this parrot mean? He's just repeating something he's heard. And because he was preaching about Jesus and the resurrection, others said, he seems to be a propagandist for some outlandish gods. Notice how they misunderstood and mocked Paul, which always will happen to preachers. But Paul must have spoken very effectively there because he got an audience. I don't think there are very many Christians today, even church leaders, maybe even especially church leaders, who can speak effectively for Christ in the marketplace. I see this all the time when these guys are on these television shows or being interviewed and they make fools of themselves and make all of us look like fools. But Paul was effective in the marketplace. Now, someone might say, well, of course, Paul was effective. He's an apostle. <laughs> or someone might say, of course, he's a, he, was, he was supposed to do this because he's a preacher, but I'm not an apostle and I'm not a preacher. Well, that, that might be a, a little bit of an issue, but you are called, we are all called to go into our marketplace, wherever that happens to be, with the gospel of Christ. How you do that, how you take your faith into your marketplace is going to be up to your own judgment following the leading of the Spirit. I don't think that I can stand up here and give you a prepackaged way to witness in every situation and with every audience. You're going to have to figure that out following the leading of the Holy Spirit. But there are a lot, you understand, there are a lot of prepackaged the Romans road, and there's all these prepackaged, but you'll notice as Paul preached, he didn't preach the same way to every audience. Amen. He certainly didn't preach the same way to the Athenians that he did in, in the uh, synagogue. Paul had the ears of these Athenian philosophers at least for a moment. It says they took him to the council of philosophers. Come and tell us more about this new religion, verse 19. Some of the things you say seem startling to us. I like that translation. And we would like to find out what they mean. Verse 20. It occurred to me that if you have not said something startling to your hearers, then there's a good chance you have not preached the gospel. The gospel is startling to the ears accustomed to worldly wisdom. 
So Paul, when he preached there in Athens, what he said was in direct opposition to the, to the two main schools of philosophical thought, the Epicureans and the Stoics. Epicureans were people who believed that pleasure was the highest goal of life. These are people who would say, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Stoics believed in morality and the rule of law. Stoics appeared, at least on the surface, to be more dignified and righteous than the Epicureans. But neither school of thought had any concrete hope of life after death. And they both rejected the idea of a bodily resurrection. I want you to understand these two opposing philosophies are still with us today. They are represented, for example, in the liberal versus conservative culture wars. Liberal, Epicurean. Conservative, Stoic. But neither side is in agreement with the gospel. It's important that Christians do not get caught up in these philosophies because our message is the gospel, which cannot be compared to any other philosophy or worldview. Unfortunately, what happens today is that people hear Christian speech and they put it in their established categories and believe it's the same thing, but it's not. Mm -hmm. The gospel is not conservatism Mm -hmm. or liberalism or Epicureanism or Stoicism. It's something entirely different. Mm -hmm. The problem with the Athenian philosophers and all their modern descendants is that they only have a shallow novel interest in truth. They are people described in scripture as those who are always learning and never able to arrive at the knowledge of the truth. It is sad that the modern church also has a preoccupation with the latest cultural trends rather than eternal unchanging truth, which should be our only pursuit. We should pursue the old paths. Not the novelty, not the latest thing. As C.S. Lewis said, whatever is not eternal is eternally out of date. That's right. Amen. And finally, so we have something to see, the idols underneath the sins of society. We have something to feel, godly jealousy for those in error. We have some place to go to take our faith into the marketplace. And finally, we have something to declare. What should we declare to our modern Athens? We should declare the glory of God and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What Paul does in his sermon in Athens is he compares the power of God and the resurrection to the emptiness of their speculative philosophies and religious idolatry. It's very important to see here that Paul was not trying to just be friendly. Paul was not trying to build a so-called bridge so that they could be friends. I say that because there's a lot of approaches to reaching pagan people that says, you have to be their friend first before you can reach them for Christ. That isn't true. Paul wasn't trying to be their friend here. He's trying to reach them with a message. He was showing the difference between the religion and philosophy of the Greeks and the gospel of Christ. He's making a comparison and a contrast. And we've got to restore Paul's method. There's so much softening of the message of Christ today in order not to offend pagans then I'm not really sure people see the uniqueness of the gospel. Many churches are trying to show that they are just like everyone else when they should be showing that we are different because the gospel is different from every other religion and philosophy. I really couldn't say it any better than it stated in Robertson's Word Pictures when he summarizes Paul's message. He said this, it's been said that Paul left the simple gospel in this address to the Council of the Areopagus for philosophy. Some scholars have said that. Paul didn't really preach the gospel in Athens. But did he? He skillfully caught their attention by reference to an altar to an unknown God whom he interprets to be the creator of all things and all men who overrules the whole world and who now commands repentance of all and has revealed his will about a day of reckoning when Jesus Christ will be the judge. He has preached the unity of God, the one and only God, has proclaimed repentance, a judgment day, Jesus as the judge, as shown by his resurrection, great fundamental doctrines, and doubtless had much more to say when they interrupted his address. There is no room for such a charge against Paul. 
that Paul somehow dropped the ball in Athens. It's ridiculous. But scholars have said that. Robertson continues, He rose, Paul rose to a great occasion and made a masterful exposition of God's place and power in human history. End quote. And I agree completely. I couldn't say it any better than that. So what did Paul preach in Athens? Two things, the glory of God and the resurrection of Christ. I think the heart of Paul's sermon is the glory of God. Paul reasons against idolatry by declaring the glory of the biblical God. And I wish I had time to go into the details, but I want to summarize his sermon in three simple points. Paul says, first of all, God is the creator. This is the foundation of all biblical revelation. And so therefore, it's a logical conclusion that it's ignorant to treat God as though he were made with our hands when we in fact have been made by his. You see the reasoning? Idolatry is inherently foolish. Secondly, Paul says that God is sovereign. His hand of providence appears in the history of all men, not just the Jews. Nations rise and fall, but not by chance or blind fate. God has never abandoned his creation, but has purpose for the world. The purpose of life, Paul says, is to seek God. That's what you should be doing. And God is governing the nations so that they would seek for the meaning of life. And so Paul is saying to the Athenians, don't turn away from God as the nations have done in the past, as he talks about in Romans chapter 1. And then thirdly, Paul says God is the judge. He will ultimately hold men accountable. The implication here is that God will hold man responsible for not seeking him as they should. The sad fact of human history is that men have not been seeking God, even though they should. And even though, as Jesus said, if we seek, we will find. Now, if it is true, according to John 17, 3, if it is true that knowing God is eternal life, then to be ignorant of God is our greatest liability. And yet we find ourselves in a time and a place where millions are ignorant of God, even though they may be religious, just like the Athenians. So Paul preached the, re- the glory of God, but he also preached Jesus and the resurrection in the city of Athens. Why did Paul preach the resurrection? Why not the cross? Why, why specifically the resurrection? I believe he's trying to emphasize here to these idolaters the objectivity of Christianity. In other words, the resurrection is an undeniable historical fact. Something that Paul himself knew to be true because he had himself seen the risen Christ. Amen. So Christian, in other words, Christianity is not just another philosophy of life. It's not just about an inward peace. It, Christianity is based on an undeniable fact. Something that God did within human history. He raised his son Jesus from the dead. Here is the proof of all the claims of Christianity. Someone has risen from the dead. Here is a fact that all men must receive or die eternally. So so Paul preached the resurrection. But notice it says Paul preached Jesus. Jesus. Paul preached a personal Savior. Mm -hmm. A person we can come to know and trust and love. Mm -hmm. You see, the gospel says that truth became a person. Mm -hmm. Amen. Truth became a person in Jesus Christ. And so you see, there are really only two kinds of people in the world. Even today. Mm -hmm. Two kinds of people. There are people who are trying to save themselves through idols. Mm -hmm. And all idols are really functional saviors. Mm -hmm. People are saying to these these idols, they're saying to these idols, Save me Mm -hmm. from unhappiness. Save me from a feeling of meaninglessness. Mm -hmm. There are those who are trying to save themselves through worshiping idols. And there are those who are trusting Jesus to save them. Thank you, brethren. Amen.